Okay. Everybody, how y'all doing? Woo. All right, well, hopefully we can get the uh, you know, level of excitement about peer-to-peer -peer on the web a little higher after the end of this talk, or maybe not, we'll see. All right, why peer-to-peer -peer deserves another chance? Like she said, I work on the Beaker browser. This is something that we've been working on for about two and a half or three years. And uh, let's just dig right into it. Who here, let's see if my clicker works, there we go. Who here used Napster back in the day? All right, yeah, that's a fair amount. Uh, it doesn't look as pretty as I remember it. <laughs> Uh, how about uh, after that? Let's see. There we go. Kaze. Any Kaze users? Yeah, all right. Yeah, that was, that was me. It's a little prettier. I remember that about like that. And then how about LimeWire? Any LimeWire people? Yeah, all right. So around like the end of the 90s, it seemed for a while that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing was going to be a really big part of the web. And then it super wasn't. Um, and you may, may remember this, Lars Ulrich from Metallica, suing the crap out of Nef uh, Napster. Uh, and this is one of the big reasons, of course, that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing fell off. It started to become a problem that copyright infringement was such a core usage of it. But I would actually argue that the lawsuits weren't the only reason that peer-to-peer -peer fell off. Um, they certainly didn't help, but they could have been overcome. I think actually the problem is that none of our platforms, none of our major you know, networking platforms ever adopted it. Because around the turn of the century, the web was starting to take off. The web used a server client model, never in uh, integrated anything that was peer-to-peer -peer, like uh, BitTorrent. And so we just kind of went from LAN computing to cloud computing and just missed peer-to-peer -peer in the middle. So the argument I would make is that now is a really good chance for us to go back and look at what we might have missed by never getting peer-to-peer -peer into our web stack. OK, so let's talk about how that would work really fast. The current model on the web is server client. That means that you have a server that runs all of the software, that maintains all the data, that handles all the operations, everything like that. And everybody else in the network is just a client. And we call them a thin client because they don't run any of the software, really. They just provide a view to this software that runs somewhere else on the server. So if we're talking about doing a peer-to-peer -peer system, there's no longer a server involved in the application. Instead, what we're going to do is have every different device running some part of the software and handling some part of the data and, and the execution environment and things like this. So the mechanics of this are a little tricky. It's a new way of doing things. And I'll get into how that works, but first I want to talk about why even bother. What's the upside to switching to a peer-to-peer -peer architecture? Well, the first is decentralization. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But what I specifically am referring to here is decentralizing the software. So that rather than having all of the software be controlled and chosen by the people that run the server, instead, every user can choose which software they want to run. And because you're not having to use this one server to connect, you can choose your own application and still use the protocol to connect to other people who potentially could all be running their own applications. So we're talking about a more open software stack on the web. Next is data ownership, again, because there's no server. Rather than sending all of your data into somebody else's database, you're keeping it all locally. This means that, for instance, if a service ever goes down because they've gone on their magnificent journey and they're shuddering, um, you could still keep control of your data and just move to another application. Connected to that is a better data privacy story. In a peer-to-peer -peer model, we can more readily just connect to the intended recipient for data as opposed to having to use an intermediary all the time. So potentially, we can get a much more secure data model built into the web. This one should appeal to everybody here, since uh, I'm pretty sure most people here are developers. Um, in the current model of the web, because everything relies on a server, if you want to make an application, you've got to stand up a server somewhere and maintain it for anybody that wants to uh, you know, use the application. And that's such a pain that right now serverless is becoming a thing, right? Well, if we do actually serverless, we're talking about absolutely no DevOps. The application is going to run on users' devices rather than some server that you stand up somewhere. The final benefit of peer-to-peer -peer is, a, I think, a better open source model. Right now, even if you're using a completely open source stack on your server, the end user has no insight into that. 
The server is a complete black box to them. So I could be using your open source web application, but I'm not going to be able to look at the source or modify it or fork the application unless maybe you leave a GitHub link somewhere, but it's not connected to the actual web platform. In a peer-to-peer -peer model, because you're downloading the entire application to your local device, you'll have access to that source. And if it's licensed for open source, you can fork it and start to modify it directly from within the browser. So these are the upsides. This is what the talk's about. Why P2P? These are the five things that I would point to for why this is worth doing. So how is it going to work? Well, let's start with how we're going to deal with replacing HTTP. Because the basic thing that we need to be able to do is host and browse to websites. So we need to drop in replacement for HTTP. A natural first technology to look at is BitTorrent. I think a lot of people here are familiar with BitTorrent, at least on some level. It's basically a way to run a distributed file server where anybody's computer can join in and become a part of that server. And we call those seeding the, uh, the files in the torrent. So they're seeders. And the mechanics are that whenever you create a torrent, you create a torrent file. This torrent file breaks up the data into a bunch of different blocks and puts a bunch of checksums in it. And what you do whenever you want to download a torrent is you look at the torrent file, join into the swarm, find peers, and ask for data. And you don't want to have to trust those peers because they could be anybody, right? So what you do is you ask for the data from all the different random peers that are inside the network. And when you receive the information, you check the checksum against what's in that torrent file. So you're able to authenticate the data without having to trust the peers. And that's how you can have this giant decentralized open swarm for a torrent. The upsides for torrents, there's really two things that are interesting about it. One is that anybody could be a server. So as long as somebody's interested in the uh, torrent information, that torrent can stay online. The other interesting aspect of it is this bandwidth sharing aspect. If there's more than one peer on the network, you can talk to both of them and download from both of them at the same time. So almost, it's almost like load balancing is built into the protocol. The problem with BitTorrent that doesn't quite make it right for us is that it's a static protocol. Once you create a torrent file, you can't change the files inside of it. And that's not going to be suitable for the web, where web, uh, web pages need to change all the time. So that being the main reason, but for a couple of other interesting improvements we've been able to make, we have instead worked on the DAT protocol. DAT is a lot like BitTorrent. We call it sometimes a BitTorrent variant uses the same basic mechanics, but changes the core mechanism of how you find data on the network. Whereas in BitTorrent, you use these torrent files. In DAT, you use a public key. And this is how you address uh, a DAT website. So it looks like that. It's a 64-character hex-encoded string. It's very ugly. But the way it works is that the files inside of a DAT are signed by that key pair. So whenever I go online and I want to look at somebody's DAT, when I want to browse to it, I'll plug in the public key. It'll look on the network for peers, receive the data from peers, and then validate that data it receives by checking the signature on each file. It's a pretty simple mechanism. There's a couple of details I'm leaving out, but that's at a high level how that works. Now, like I said, that public key is a pretty ugly URL, so we can also use DNS. And so you could almost think of that public key as being the P2P equivalent to an IP address, the thing that you generally don't look at. Instead, you would want to use DNS so that you could have nice, pretty URLs. And when you navigate to a DAT site, the experience is going to be exactly the same as uh, an HTTP site. So this is the current work in progress beta of Beaker. So this may change a little bit before we release it. But this is what it looks like if you go to my um, Personal website right now. Works exactly the same way as HTTP does. You have an index.html and an image tag that's embedded. But the interesting aspect of this is that we're basically embedding a server into the browser. So it's almost like you have Nginx or Apache attached to the browser itself. And like Nginx or Apache, you have a list of DAT websites that you keep online from your browser. But then because of this peer-to-peer -peer quality, 
Not only are people able to connect to your device to pull off uh, websites from it, but other people can help keep it online. Now, because you have the server inside of your browser, you're also able to go through the entire creation and um, development flow for a website using the browser itself. So we have this button here inside of the browser menu to create a new website. It'll take you to this menu to fill out details about it, what's the title and description, who do you want to be able to find the website, and there's a template section that's not populated yet because we're still working on the beta, but on the left side, you'll have some pre-created templates to select from to get you started faster. And then it drops you into the new web page with an editor built into the side. And there are a couple of reasons we did that. One, just because we could. But it's kind of trying to get back to what the original idea of the web was supposed to be. Um, in Tim Berners lab, uh, Tim Berner Lee's original web browser, if you look at the top, it's a hypermedia browser slash editor. Not just a browser, it's a browser and editor. Somehow that got lost along the way. And we're bringing it back. So how do permissions work in this system? Who gets to control what's inside of these websites? Well, the basic model is based on this public key. Public key has a private key that goes with it, and only the person that controls the private key can make changes to a website. So if you're the one that creates a website, by default, you're the only one that's able to make changes to it. Everybody else is in a read-only mode. Now, we're still working on this, but the plan is to make it so that you can share that private key with other users, so that you can appoint new writers to a website and collaborate on the files inside of it. Uptime is another interesting question for this. There's no magic to the peer-to-peer -peer system in the sense that you don't push the website automatically to some other nodes on the network. You know, we, we don't force people to host for other people. You always choose to do it. There's no blockchain in there, nothing like that. So at the end of the day, you still need to have at least one computer keeping a website online. And how are you going to do that? How are you going to get the uptime you need? Well, one basic mechanism is social hosting. You'll notice in the URL bar, we have a lot of different buttons in there. But one of the buttons is a host button. So if you go to a website created by a friend of yours, or maybe it's just a website that interests you particularly, you can click on that button, and your browser will start to help keep the site online anytime that your computer's online. So that's a nice mechanism for helping each other out, helping maintain uptime, help share bandwidth, things like that, kind of an altruistic sharing mechanism. But it's not quite good enough to maintain total uptime because there's no SLA to your social graph. You're not going to get any guarantees from anybody that they'll keep their device online when yours is off. So at the end of the day, what we end up doing is adding a cloud into it. The interesting thing about using a cloud is that it's a peer just like anything else. There's no hard binding to it. It's not running any business logic. All of the data that it contains is actually just copies of your data that's on your, your computer, and it doesn't have any of the private keys. So you could almost think of using the cloud like a, a dumb cache or a CDN. And overall, you could think of the entire system as being this grid designed for hosting. You have your personal laptop as the kind of the root of your, your, your hosting grid, but then you can pull in a cloud service to help keep your files online, or you could stick a Raspberry Pi in the corner of your room somewhere, use that as your little personal cloud. And these different nodes are completely interchangeable. That's the point of the peer-to-peer -peer system. There's nobody that's privileged inside that system. So you could start using a cloud service to keep your files online, but at some point say, you know what, I want to have a little more you know, independence. I want to be more self-reliant. So you could stick a server in the corner somewhere and migrate over. And nobody would know. These are all just peers on this, on this hosting grid. OK, so the real burning question, I think, is how do we build applications on this model? The static website hosting is pretty straightforward. You go to a website, you see the files, and you browse them around. But how do you build dynamic applications, things like Twitter or Reddit or even a search engine? Well, this is what we've been working on for the most part for the past two and a half years. Again, like I said, there's no server and there's no blockchain solution or anything like that. We're working only with the DAT protocol, which is this peer-to-peer -peer files 
protocol. So we need to have an application model that's built off that technology. And there are three models in particular that we've zoned in on for the uh, next version of the browser. Self-mutating websites, social aggregation, and real-time messaging. So I'm going to break each of these down. Self-mutating websites is kind of a fancy way of saying websites that modify themselves. Mutate means to change. So there's a web API inside of Beaker for reading and writing files inside of a data archive. And so you can use this API to build a single page application which reads and writes its own files. If you're the, one of the writers on a website, you can actually make changes to it. If you're not, it can only just read the files using this API. And so the use case to imagine is, let's say you have a video channel. It's a pretty simple, kind of like a little CMS. Because all you're trying to do is list a set of videos that you've created, give them some metadata like a title and things like that. So to do that, your single page application, its JavaScript will use the Data Archive API to read from the videos folder to find out what it should display. And then when you press that new website button, or excuse me, that new video button right there, it's just going to use the write file API to add the file to itself. It's the self-mutating website. And this is a pretty effective model for anything that's kind of a self-contained application, things that might be like a CMS or a piece of content. So this works for text documents like a Google Doc or a, um, a GitHub gist can be done this way. Spreadsheets can be done this way, slideshows or presentations, photo albums, wikis, bundles of files, things like that. So self-mutating websites, that's our first application model. The second model that we've been exploring is social aggregation. This is basically RSS. The idea is really simple. Let's talk about how it applies in RSS, since a lot of people are familiar with that. In RSS, you set up an XML file, like feed.xml. It's a structured piece of data, so it's readable by a computer. And it just gives some metadata about what you have posted recently on your blog or on your podcast. So you've got the name of your blog, a description about it, and then this list of items showing what blog posts you've put recently and when they were done. So the model for this is really straightforward. If somebody subscribes to your blog, they're just going to periodically check this XML file, pull it down off of your website. And they'll process all this data, stick it in a little personal database, so that they can create a listing of recent blog posts. Well, that model works really well. You can do that exact uh, data model for more than just blogging and podcasts. You can do it for comments on websites. You can do it for upvotes and downvotes, um, emoji reactions on things like Facebook does. So we've applied that model to this peer-to-peer -peer web. By default, whenever the beaker starts in the upcoming version, it creates a personal website for you. And that personal website is meant to be your identity on this, on this network. So I'd be datpfrazy.com. And there's the ability to follow other people's websites just built right in. There's a button for it in the URL bar. And when you follow somebody, it's the exact same idea as in RSS when you subscribe to their site. Your browser is going to periodically check all the sites that you follow, pull down any JSON files that it understands, and put them in an index. And you're able to build applications off of this local index now. This is an example application we built. This is a Twitter clone, using this exact structure for the application model. All of the different posts that are like tweets are just JSON files on people's personal websites. Here's what one of those JSON files look like. The standard for the JSON specs that we've created is called Unwalled Garden. And we put it in this fairly long, oh, well, here we go. We put it in this fairly long path. But it's a fixed path, so we know where to look. We look inside the unwalled data, unwalled garden posts folder for the JSON files. And then the JSON itself is relatively straightforward. So 
what is the type of this file, what's the content of it, and when was it published. We've got that wrapped in an API so that you can just run posts.add and it'll create this file for you. But at the end of the day, this is all just interacting with this dat file system. So if I wanted to get a look at a feed, let's say I'm starting from scratch here and I wanted to list all of the posts from the Beaker browser website and import the API from the uh, Unwalled Garden site, I'd follow the Beaker browser site right there and then I'd list my feed. And assuming I'm the new user, that would be the only feed in my, uh, uh, only uh, website in my feed, so I'd just be seeing the Beaker browser posts. So this model works for a number of interesting applications. Social media is an obvious one, so if you wanted to build a Twitter clone. Uh, comment sections is another interesting use case for this. You're going to see posts, or comments rather, from people that you follow only. Hopefully that's a good thing. Fewer randos in your comments. Works really well for publishing. So any kind of content that you want to publish, like blog posts or videos or even code modules, people can follow you and stay up to date on the things that you've published. Works for events and calendars. And then, broadly speaking, this can work for search. So basically, any kind of content that you publish in this model could be um, indexed for search. The final application model that we've been looking at is real-time messaging. This is kind of an obvious choice for peer-to-peer. -peer. And it's no different than what you do with WebRTC. It's just opening a data channel or a messaging channel between two different browsers. And we're not actually planning to use WebRTC because we have some tooling inside of DAT that allows us to connect to people without having to use signaling servers, which is a major pain whenever you're using WebRTC. So in the model that we're building, you can actually just connect directly to people and have authenticated connections, or anonymous connections if, you're, if you want. Now, the API is still in progress, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time looking at this, but this is one of the APIs that will be available for messaging. It's a way of basically extending the DAT protocol with new message types. We're probably going to encourage a different model for the most part using a new API called PureSockets, but for now, this will be the first API that we put out. And it, is a very straightforward way to be able to say, OK, I have a new message type. You register the extension. You can list the peers and send a message using that extension type. And then you can listen for new messages off that. I think the use cases for this are pretty straightforward. Chat is a very obvious thing you can do with it. Another interesting op opportunity with that is you can emulate the, the uh, you know, HTTP post mechanism. So if maybe you have a registration form. You could set up one of these connections so that the owner of the website is listening. You, maybe they keep their website online, keep their browser online, and other people can send their forum registrations or whatever using this messaging mechanism. Polls and surveys could be done like this, even RSVPs, collaborative docs, again, like Google Docs using maybe CRDTs. So these are the application models that we're looking at for building on top of the peer-to-peer -peer web. All right, so wrapping up, why does peer-to-peer -peer deserve another chance? Just to reiterate my points earlier, decentralization, I think, is something worth having. Giving people the opportunity to work directly with their software is a nice benefit. It's maybe something that we ought to be thinking a lot about whenever we're dealing with how's Twitter going to work, how's Facebook going to work, are we happy with targeted ads? Maybe it would be nice if, as users, we had control over the software directly. Are we going to have ownership of our data, or are we going to always be stuck using Facebook? Are we going to have privacy over what we send, or are we always going to wonder if WhatsApp is going to get backdoored at some point? It seems like privacy ought to be something that's baked into the platform itself. No DevOps. It's a pretty obvious benefit. And then open source. Let's take it all the way to the end point. Let's not have any black boxes in the system. Let's have the application get downloaded entirely onto our devices and be forkable from the browser itself. I think that'd be a nice fulfillment of what Stallman set out to do in the first place. So this is the Beaker beta that's coming up, Beaker 09. It's not yet done. Uh, there is a version of Beaker that's a little bit older that you can download now if you're interested. 
but we have a new version coming up with a new version of the DAT protocol and a lot of new tooling inside of the browser. And this should be coming out sometime during the fall, so keep an eye out for that. And if you want to keep up to date, you can follow us on Twitter. We got at Beaker Browser for that, or at PFrazy to follow me. So thank you all very much.